Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. Later on in the program, we're going to take a, take a look at free market philosophies. Don't worry, it'll be good and academic. But first, I wanted to talk about safety in schools, safety in office buildings, and mass shootings. And this is going to be a little t difficult, so stay with us. John, Michael, Keynes, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Let's quickly start off with the, with the story. And I... I want to be delicate how I do this because I've lost a child and it, it, it haunts me every day, but I had, didn't lose a child to violence the way you did. And uh, the, the way you function with it is, is it, it, it amazes me. Well, in, in 2006, a gunman entered Platte Canyon High School and held seven girls hostage. And over the course of the afternoon, the gunman had released five of those girls. and he had claimed to have enough explosives to level the building and ultimately the decision was made to try to rescue the girls and uh, Jefferson County Regional SWAT team uh, breached that classroom door uh, and as they got in there the gunman shot Emily and then brought the weapon to himself. How old was Emily? 16. 16. While uh, she was held hostage she was able to send a text message I love you guys. Wow. And I that's what we guys. named the foundation after. And now you run the I Love You Guys Foundation. Yeah. Um, you have turned, for, for those who haven't been through losing a child, and again, what you've been through is, is such a different dimension. I lost my daughter to, to cancer. That was tough. But I had a chance to say goodbye. I got, a, I, I got to see it coming. The idea of just waking up one day and, and it being over uh, in such a horrific manner, I, I, I can't imagine. A lot of people do something with their grief, which is why we have foundations. It's why people name buildings. It's, 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 as a parent, you can't let that memory go. You must use it for good. You, in my point, I, I feel like I need to do what I know Parker, my daughter, would have done. You know, so my job is now to do to do what I was going to do in my life, plus do enough of what she was going to do in her life. And I don't know what that was. You turn this grieving into something that I believe is is saving lives. What drew you to to, to safety, particularly in schools? In all honesty, for the first couple years, the foundation was almost a burden. Yeah. And uh, that's the advice when I talk to folks that are in a similar situation. Don't start a foundation. And, and yet, as we started looking at school safety, and this was a meme that was constantly pushed on the foundation, uh, realized that there wasn't a common language between student staff and first responders in a crisis. And there were schools that still used code words and response levels and, and FEMA has been out there saying big and loud plain language don't use codes and we looked around to see if there was something out there that made sense because I'm certainly not going to reinvent a wheel right. that's already there and we found language in Knoxville Tennessee in the same language in Broomfield Colorado and when you say language language of what? Of what to do in a crisis. So the what standard, to do if a shooter comes in your school or your office building? Not just building a shooter, but other things happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the the language is based on four actions: lock out, lock down, evacuate, and shelter. Each action is followed by a directive. So lock out, secure the perimeter. Lock down, locks lights out of sight. Evacuate to a location and shelter for a hazard using a safety strategy. And so if there's criminal activity in the neighborhood, a school will go into lockout, but it's still business as usual in the school. Right. And when that language is shared with law enforcement and fire, then we start to have a partnership between the governments. And this is a lesson that we learned and the community learned the hard way after Columbine, yeah. that it wasn't, it wasn't, there were no bad intentions, but the response to Columbine was the wrong response. Uh, there was no coordination. There was uh, um, different departments not talking to each other, using not only different communication mm -hmm. systems, but as you say, different, different words. Language. Yeah. And also a, a strategy of 
hold back. Let's take a look at the situation, Let's see if we can negotiate. Let's see if we can that do this. Was, that was called the four C's, control, contain, contact, and call SWAT. And what Columbine taught law enforcement is that an active shooter isn't a SWAT dilemma. It's a school resource officer dilemma. It's a patrol officer dilemma. And so tactics have been changing. So, stop, because you're going fast on this. So you're saying <laughs> that, that it reminds me, uh, before 9-11, mm -hmm. somebody hijacks a plane, you work with them because they're going to Cuba, and yeah. you want them to release. After that, things change. Now, if you're a passenger on a plane and a 9-11 situation happens, those people are going to act very differently. Before yes. they were, they stayed still. They, you know, let's go along, knowing the real and imminent danger. You know, go ahead, take a box cutter to somebody on a plane now. Everyone else will throw every laptop, coke can, gang tackle you, whatever to do it. In the yeah. same, is it is it a fair analogy to say what you're trying to do is to change the culture of what goes on in, in schools and other buildings? Absolutely. To to say this is not a wait and see. This is get it done now. Well, and, and the shared language is really the first part. Um, what we're seeing is that it really creates a bridge between law enforcement and schools, um, and. And I think that's essential, and it's essential for both sides. I'll, I'll tell you a story about uh, Deputy Kimball, El Paso County. Uh, he'd been a deputy for three or four years, but his entire career, he worked a graveyard shift or a mid-shift. So when do you encounter teenagers at those times? Those are the mischief times. Yeah, those are those. You don't want to encounter teenagers <laughs> those times, yeah. And so he, his wife got pregnant, and he, there was a school resource officer job open. And he said, you know, John Michael, for the first two weeks, I looked at all these kids like I did when I met them at midnight. And I realized that 99% of them are great kids. And so that partnership isn't simply about schools partnering, and that's the benefit to the school. Right. We've got a, a law enforcement on premises. Um, but it's uh, really beneficial to law enforcement, to the men and women who do it. Because they get to communicate with people they don't ever communicate with. They get to yeah, right. and and the school resource officers are a unique, unique breed. Um, and there are some in Colorado who've been doing it for 15, 16 years, and they are as much a partner in an intervention as they are necessarily there just to write a ticket. The I Love You Guys Foundation, um, brought to life from the death of your daughter. What is the main thing you're, who, who do you work with? What is the training you give them? And what is it people should know? We work with districts, departments, and agencies. And occasionally I'll get in front of a handful of kids. Um, yeah. and, uh, and we show them what the protocol is all about, how to implement it in their schools. And we provide all the information online at no cost. And so they can download everything and begin. Uh, part of the training I do is, I call it the, the three A's. Uh, some folks are a little apathetic when we start. Hopefully I'll get their attention, and in the end, I'll move them to action. And that's really what I do, is I go out and talk to districts, departments, and agencies and say, let's go. So, our first presentation on the standard response protocol was in April of 2009. Um, circumstances sort of happened where the Department of Justice invited us to, to present this concept at a national safety conference in July of 2009. Um, I had presented it to Jefferson County School District and uh, he called me back and we were talking about piloting it, being right. the very first pilot. He called and said, we're not going to pilot this. We're going to implement it in all 163 schools starting in September. Wow. And that first year, we ended the school year with a dozen schools across the country and 250 here in Colorado implementing the program. And again, the program is to make sure that law enforcement and school districts and principals and staff, one, they're speaking the same language yeah. when something bad happens, whatever that bad thing is, and to teach them what to do, how to do it, and how to do it quickly to make sure and they're all on the same page. All on the same page and, and, and create this culture of awareness. Um, 
Department of Education recently recommended run, hide, fight. And I think messaging is essential, and that's tough messaging for a kindergarten teacher. Run, hide, fight. Yeah. So in other words, an active shooter is in the school, run, I mean, that's evacuate, hide. Uh, it's hard to fight if you're a tin, yeah, kindergarten teacher sure, it is. or if you're in kindergarten. Right, I, I get that. So what's the difference? Um, we looked at the data and uh, a, very, a man who's grown to be a very dear friend um, in law enforcement, a uh, retired team leader from Jeffco Regional SWAT. He, uh, he said, tactics are intel driven, but environment dictates the tactics. What's our intel? 75% of the time in an active shooter event, the bad guy walks through the front door into what? The hallway. Right. Intel point, number one. Next one, I think we can agree that most schools are basically long runs of corridor with classrooms on either side. If we tell students that their first option is to run, they're going to run into the hallway and into the shooter. And um, that doesn't mean running isn't a bad idea. Sometimes it may be the best idea, but it shouldn't be the prime idea. Um, environment dictates tactics. We've got corridors, and here's one other piece of intel. Rarely, if ever, has somebody behind a locked door been harmed in an active shooting. So, no, in other words, locking, locking the classroom door, kind of like locking the cockpit door, might be a simple barrier that, that could save lives. Yes, a time barrier. Right. And that's what we want to create. Interesting. Let me, let me talk a little bit and ask you, we talked about the motivation. I mean, I've, I've, I've felt the same sort of things. To take this tragedy and, and use it, uh, use, it with your, use it for your daughter in her memory, but you haven't gone to government and said, we need to change the laws. And I, you know, I, I look at people who have lost loved ones through violence, and I don't know if I wouldn't do exactly what they're doing. You know, if, if you were in Sandy Hook and they said, you know, we need to, we need to go and push gun laws. That's what we need to do. And so the, the immediate thought is we need to go to government. Government make a mandate to do something. Your, your foundation does something really different. You went out and it has really nothing to do with mandates. It has nothing to do with, with forcing government. Yeah. You've actually gone to the government and said, I think there's a better way for us to do things. Let me, let me convince you about it. And the traction has been un incredible. It absolutely has. And, and, and part of that is uh, occasionally with legislation we see unintended consequences. And I think in the arena of school safety, we need to be very careful and thoughtful about what we do legislatively. Um, as we were starting this, the other thing was, is it right? And, and finally, sometimes legislation will constrict the direction when the thought processes change. Right. And so we certainly also knew that a top-down push on an unproven program isn't going to happen. Um, so we That's never stopped a top-down push on any government <laughs> program. Um, I, I just, we went grassroots and, and, and it's and, working. Well, the wheels started turning real quick. Um, today, we've got about 1,300 schools in Colorado using the protocol. Wow. Across the country, at least 7,500 that we know of. And, and the reason I say that is that on the website, I don't have any barriers to downloading the materials. It's right. more important to get the materials in than it is to hear about it. Um, and, and a week doesn't go by where somebody, I bump into somebody, they say, oh, we've been using your program for years. You were a computer programmer. Yeah. I mean, you made some money. Now you're doing this and you're doing it full time. How are you funded and how can people help? We are, we gladly take donations. Um, that's certainly one thing. At I love you guys. I love you guys. Com. The U being the letter U. I love letter U guys. Yeah. Which is the text you got from your, from your daughter. Wow. Um, 
And again, all the resources at the website are free. People ought to use them, download them. Yeah. We're refreshing the website next week and we've changed the terms of use. Initially, it was at no cost to districts, departments, and agencies. Um, in a suggested donation with private schools and organizations. And we've backed off on that. It is at no cost to anybody. Incredible. And again, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but taking what, you, what you've done, the tragedy you, you've, you've had, and turn it into something that's saving lives, but also to do it with, without, without taking a cause and say, this is what has to be right for everybody. Is, is an amazing thing, and I, I don't know if I would be able to do it. I appreciate it. John, thank you very much. I really appreciate you thank being you. here. Stay tuned.